things. Uh, and it's recording. Okay, so hi, my name is Sam Harlow. I am the online learning librarian as well as the library liaison to kinesiology, public health education, and community and therapeutic recreation. Um, welcome to the UNCG Libraries webinar series on online learning and innovation. In this series, different UNCG te instructional technology consultants, ITS staff, faculty, and librarians cover topics on online learning and pedagogies, UNCG instructional technology tools, and more. These 30-minute webinars are recorded in Zoom, where we are now, where we're in a pilot at UNCG, or WebEx meetings and placed on the library, this library webpage that I'm about to drop into the chat. Um, this webpage will also include any materials, extra materials like this presentation. Uh, it has tons of links to the tools that we're gonna cover today. Um, so just a couple of logistical things about how this webinar is gonna run. Please mute yourself by clicking the audio icon um, at the bottom of your screen or next to your name uh, by turning it red or putting like an X over it and feel free to turn it back on at the end of the webinar to ask me questions or to participate in a conversation. Uh, if you don't have a microphone, you're also welcome to participate in chat. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please put them in chat and I'll track the questions and get to them uh, when it uh, makes sense. So um, I am the host and the technical person today, so it would be kind of hard for me to handle both. But here is my email address if you want to let me know about anything going on. Um, but also note that this is being recorded. So if anything goes on, we'll definitely send you the recording. So um, as I'm starting to introduce this, uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so I'm gonna get going. So today we're gonna talk about uh, Open Educational Resources, OER, and Open Pedagogy at UNCG, um, or using open source technology to work with students. So, um, like I said at the beginning, my name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian, and I've recently taken over uh, Open Educational Resources at UNCG, OER, with Melody Rood, who's in the room with us today. Um, and uh, I teach online as well in an online asynchronous course, and I'm a liaison librarian, uh, so I work with a lot of different faculty. So that is my experience with teaching and using online stuff. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is open educational resources, or otherwise known as OER. So um, here's a definition that I like, that I use a lot. So OER are teaching and learning and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use or repurposing by others. Um, so, and there's where this comes from, a report. So um, the big thing about it with these licenses is that they need anything that is in the OER world, right, has to have these five R's of openness. So if you create your own um, video or textbook or anything like that on your own and you want it to be true OER, truly in open education, you need to have a license on it that makes it that it can be retained, reused, revised, remixed and redistributed. So it's not just enough to make it free, like that's how it's talked about a lot, is putting things online for free, but it also has this adaptability, right? That other people can find your stuff and then they can remix it, reuse it, revise it on their own as well. So um, here's some graphs that we like to use a lot when we talk about OER because creating OER materials, whether um, you're a faculty member or a librarian, um, helps reduce costs for student, uh, students. So this graph over here, um, right here, we use it a lot. Um, it's the percent change since 1978 for educational books, medical services, new home prices, and uh, CPI, the Consumer Price Index. So note that even above medical services that has risen 575% in the last 30 years, um, College textbooks, educational books, have risen 812% in the last 30 years. So this is, of course, bad for our students. Uh, great for publishers who are making money, but not great for our students. You're having to, of course, pay sometimes up to $300 for a textbook, or even just to get a digital code to go online. So of course, um, student loan debt is also a problem. Here's a little cartoon um, where the um, student is moving back in with its parents. And then, you know, they say, move back home. Kids today are so lazy and irresponsible. Your mother and I started out with nothing. 
and then here's this five figure student loan debt. Trust me, I would have loved starting out with nothing, but see, he's coming home um, with this huge debt. So, and here's a quote from one of our students at UNCG um, about, I stopped buying textbooks my second semester here. So with this high cost of textbooks, we of course also have um, the issue of um, uh, students not even using the textbooks that you assign. So um, a big part of OER is finding OER stuff. So of course there's not a, like, it's not perfect. <laughs> um, depending on your topic, it might not be out there. But here are some of the major OER repositories that you can put OER materials that you create back into, or you can go to for inspiration. Um, Canvas also has a link within the left-hand navigation called Canvas Commons that has a lot of OER um, materials in there because you can add the stuff to your course. It makes the license really clear um, and more. So um, this is really all we're gonna say about OER today. It's a kind of quick introduction and then we're gonna flow straight into open pedagogy. So like using OER stuff in your teaching. So definitely let me know if you have any questions. We're also gonna cover OER at UNCG towards the end. Uh, but if you have any questions of that up front, feel free to let me know. But we're gonna talk about the grants and some resources here at UNCG uh, towards the end of this webinar. So let's dive in to open pedagogy. So open pedagogy is based a lot upon this idea of getting rid of something that we call disposable assignments. So these are assignments that students complain about doing and faculty complain about grading. They're assignments that add no value to the world. After a student spends three hours creating it, a teacher spends 30 minutes grading it, and then the student throws it away. So ideally, that's not what we want to happen. So here's a little graph about um, a familiar scenario, disposable assignments. So um, faculty come to librarians for assignment support all the time. Um, you're asked to do a one shot for a first year writing class in which the students are asked to write a research paper. Um, and then of course you as the teachers, right, are gonna have to grade them. Um, and then the students complain. And at this point, the professor, uh, y'all, will spend an entire weekend grading the papers and leaving constructive feedback that you put a lot of time into. Um, there's um, maybe even evidence of plagiarism because the student sources are cited incorrectly or, um, you know, <laughs> just other issues will come up. And then if the student likes to grade, if the students likes the grade, um, they might do that same topic again. And then maybe they will also read the feedback and they'll learn for it, but sometimes they don't. And ultimately these aren't exact original pieces of scholarship. And then again, they kind of go into this wastebasket of scholarly resources, right? Like you didn't have fun grading them and the student didn't really enjoy writing them and they won't think about it ever again after they leave. Um, so disposable assignments by the numbers are some numbers that um, my colleague, who's also an e-learning librarian, crunched based on the National Center for Education Statistics. But let's say that in the US there's 19.9 million graduates and that they have to write around two research papers per year which that means there's um, upwards of 39, over 39 million research papers being produced per year in the US, uh, which that um, calculates to about 18 hours per paper uh, if they're writing a six page research paper. So that means that based on that math, um, over 716,000 um, hours per year are spent on these assignments in terms of the students writing them. And again, maybe never using them again. So disposable assignments um, and open pedagogy, or open pedagogy is kind of asking us, what if we change these disposable assignments into activities which actually add value to the world, that actually go back into these canons, to these repositories of open materials, and they can be used again, either by the students or by other scholars. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So open pedagogy empowers students, ideally, and engages information creation. It makes students creators of information and then therefore teaches them about information ownership. Um, it creates this sense of collaboration, student agency, and authentic audiences. And it also helps students learn about information privilege, sharing, and a need for privacy, as well as creating a transformative educational experience. So here's a quote from Michelle Reed, who's an open education librarian at UNT Arlington. But open pedagogy is a high impact practice that empowers students by providing them an opportun opportunity to engage in information creation through the use of renewable assignments. Again, kind of going against disposable assignments. 
As creators of information, students in these courses gain a greater understanding of the rights and responsibilities associated with information ownership, so they may make informed decisions about their own intellectual property. Practitioners of open pedagogy embrace collaboration, student agency, and authentic audiences, while recognizing the differences in privileges and privilege and progress that impact how students balance the benefits of sharing and a need for privacy. This open educational practice challenges traditional teaching roles and has the power to transform the educational experience for both teachers and students. So um, in this link, uh, in this guide, uh, she has a whole uh, website on open pedagogy if you want to go in there and explore it um, and the details of it. Uh, but really what open pedagogy also is allowing is that really as creators, users, and contributors, um, instructors, librarians, and students all become equal partners um, in this world of information visual and digital literacy. So it kind of combines all these different pedagogies into one um, and lets our students become uh, creators and contributors into this world. So now that we've kind of talked about like the pedagogy behind it, like why we do open pedagogy, why it's useful for students, we're going to talk about specific tools and assignments uh, that use this resource. Um, so these open pedagogy really means that you're using these very open tools, sometimes referred to as open source. Uh, so because of that, I'll just say this off the bat, is that open source tools by nature don't have to be click wrapped. Or if they are click wrapped, uh, they typically go by pretty quickly because open source tools don't have any kind of contract where UNCG legal would have to get involved and uh, approve it. So um, saying that, um, here are some examples. So the first one we're going to talk about is something called hypothesis, uh, hypothesis, <laughs> however you want to pronounce it. Uh, so this is a Chrome extension that anyone can download. Again, um, you can log in, you cannot, but it allows for students and teachers to annotate, comment, and highlight any web text, including a PDF, um, through this free open Chrome extension. So here's an example of someone using Hypothesis on an article about information privilege and practice. So this is done in an LIS course at Wake Forest by Kyle Dillinger. Um, so he did this in a Lib 100 credit bearing information literacy course uh, that's fully online. So he had the students read the PDF of this article. Actually, it's a blog post on information privilege uh, by Char Booth. And then the students then commented and highlighted and commented on different parts of the text. And then they can comment on uh, each other. Another open nature of Hypothesis is that now if you go to this link right here, anyone with this Chrome app can now see the 42 comments. So this is a digital document that lives on for everyone to see what these students are commenting on and then also get involved in the conversation if they want it to be. So that is Hypothesis. Um, so if we have time, because this is a pretty quick webinar, I can show you details of how they work live, but I did want to show you screenshots for now. So another big open tool that's used a lot in open education and thinking about open pedagogy is Wikipedia. So instead of, again, assigning a student a research paper, you could assign them to create a Wikipedia page. Um, sometimes if they're a whole event, they're referred to as an edit-a-thon or you have a group of people adding Wikipedia content, typically about underrepresented populations. So here's an example of a class that did this uh, for an assignment. Uh, it was an uh, associate professor, John Beasley Murray. Uh, he used Wikipedia in the classroom and began with an experiment. The course was Spanish 312, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, Latin American Literature and Translation. Uh, this one's a pretty old example, but it's used a lot. It was done in spring 2008. He asked his students to edit and create Wikipedia articles on text and authors that they were reading in class. He also stipulated that they should bring these articles up to what Wikipedia calls featured article status. So um, this person considered this project a success. Um, it became Wikipedia's two, two, the El Senor Presidente um, feature that you see here became Wikipedia's 2000s featured article and the article was showcased on Wikipedia's main pages. So there are, of course, like issues that come with Wikipedia, um, especially now that we're in 2020 versus 2008, and it's that a lot of things have been done. Uh, that's why, again, like working with a librarian and working uh, with cohorts to kind of develop this to make sure it works for your class is a good way to go. So another um, suite of tools that has a lot of open source uh, 
free uh, tools that can be used in open pedagogy is Night Lab. So they have a couple of different uh, tools on there, but the big one that I want to talk about today is Timeline JS. Um, so all of their tools are about digital storytelling, and you can go out to their website and check it out. They have a lot of cool um, stuff, but Timeline JS is a timeline tool that allows students to create digital and visual timelines all from Google Sheets. So here's some examples of some timelines that have been made using Timeline JS. So women in computing, right? Uh, here's one. And then here's an example of one made with a class at UNCG. This is a class that I worked with uh, for an OER grant. Um, Kinesiology 286, it's, it's cross-listed with an entrepreneur, so it's Ken Entrepreneurship 286 Foundations, Foundations of Sports Coaching. So this professor got rid of a textbook for the OER mini grants, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, but um, she also went even beyond that and had these students create these open um, source, freely available timelines on coaches. So it's pretty cool. So here's an example of one on um, Pat Summit. Uh, so the link is in this slideshow, and we can go out to it. But again, you can see how this can be a good example of visual literacy, thinking about images, thinking about licensing of images, copyright, citations, also thinking about information, where are they getting it from, making it freely available. And now people can go and look at this timeline of Pat Summit, right? It's put back into the canon of stuff about coaches into the world. So another tool is Pressbooks, um, and this tool allows you to create open, accessible, and free textbooks, ebooks, or PDFs on your own. Um, so I should mention, and Anna is in the room if she wants to add anything to it, um, we're piloting a small project with OTN, Open Textbook Network Publishing for textbooks, um, some of the, one of them which is going through Pressbooks. So if you have any questions or are interested in creating your own textbook using Pressbooks, definitely email me and let me know and I can connect you to the right people and see if it's possible there. Um, but there, here's one of an example of a course where students created their own textbook. Uh, they worked together to create this open anthology of earlier American literature. Um, so this is a great example of a renewable assignment that gets cited more than um, many others. Um, so this was done by Robin DeRosa at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. Here, instead of assigning her students um, the Norton Critical Edition, which is usually used, um, she gathered public domain text into a platform called Pressbooks and then assigned her students to write the introductions to the various chapters and then annotate the text itself with that tool hypothesis that we just covered. Um, so um, this is a multi-layered open pedagogy assignment um, that again, now people can use over and over again if they're interested in learning about open anthology of earlier American um, literature because of uh, the way it is licensed and it's all public domain text. Okay, so that's just some tools. There's a lot of other freely available open tools online and here is just some of them. Uh, so Leaflet is a mobile friendly interactive online map tool that uses JavaScript. It does require some slight coding so it might not be a good thing to use with um, undergraduates, it's probably better for a graduate level course that would be interested in learning about this kind of tool. Um, but here's an example of a 1945 map, again, made by students, made by a student. Um, again, now that you can look at, um, I know that the internet's been a little bit buggy today, but um, it's again a resource that shows you how like you can click on different parts of maps. So here's a map, right, that we can click on something. It shows you information about different parts. You can zoom in. Um, again, these interactive maps. So that's what that does. H5P is an open source, interactive, accessible um, HTML5 or interactive tutorial software. Um, so it allows you to create these HTML5 interactions, um, whether they're tutorials, interactive videos, true or false questions, and then um, they allow you to create embed code. And because it's open source, um, you do log in to create it but um, anyone can access the stuff you create and then therefore you can add it in to other things, um, web pages and platforms to create these kind of uh, interactive uh, things for students to take. So be sure to check that out. And then new Google Sites is a free website that at UNCG we do have a Google EDU license. So again, it would require no like ITC um, finagling of a click wraps contract, but you can have your students create websites, right? And then use it to create, to teach them about, again, 
uh, copyright, citations, public licensing, what you can use from the internet and what you can't use from the internet. So there's lots of different ideas there. So the last thing we're going to talk about before we kind of talk about the UNCG resources is that when you're creating this stuff, when you're having your students create these renewable assignments, these open pedagogy assignments, it's important to think about accessibility because it's not really truly open if not everyone online can use it. So here are some links to some things to, for you on your own to think about. Um, one of them is on Universal Design for Learning or UDL, which is a way of thinking about learning experiences, whether they're face to face or online um, for everyone um, when hitting people at different levels of recognition, uh, expression and more. So here's a link to accessibility and creating OER materials. So it talks about UDL on campus, again, hitting these different levels of engagement, action, expression and representation. Um, it also takes you out to resources and examples of creating accessible OER materials. And um, it talks about the challenges and solutions to creating OER materials online. So this can be really useful if you yourself are trying to create OER material or again, have your students create open materials. Um, and lastly, flexible learning for open education or flow is um, a website or resource of creating online inclusive interactions uh, connecting it to open education. So it's a great resource if you're interested in this. Um, and again, for things to be truly open, they also have to be truly inclusive. So now that we're kind of heading towards the end and I talk fast, now we're going to talk about UNCG stuff. So as you probably maybe heard in your email, uh, this week at UNCG Live, hosted by UNCG Libraries, we're doing an OER week to lead up to our UNCG OER mini grants. So there's been some confusion about dates, so let me just clarify this right now, that these applications are due February 7th. So if you need some extra time, definitely let me know ASAP, but um, try to get them in around February 7th. But we have a couple of different resources on that. Uh, which I'll go into a second, but what are they? Basically, we will give you $1,000 if you are the instructor of record for a course, if you're willing to get rid of some kind of course material that costs your students money, whether that's a textbook or an app they have to buy um, or whatever, you, you reduce costs for your students um, and use other things. So these are kind of OER light grants in that we would love for you to use OER material. We'd love for you to create OER material to add back into these repositories um, for people to use. But really what we really want is to reduce costs for students. So even if you're willing to get rid of a textbook and put it permalinks into your course, right, to articles, um, work with a librarian to come in and help you, um, you know, put in permalinks or add uh, content, that is, you know, within legal means, then this is a great option. So again, it's for anyone who is an instructor of record of a course. So adjuncts um, can apply, clinical faculty, any of them, as long as you teach the course. So we have a web page on the grants, um, which include the events for this week, which y'all are in the first one, this webinar. Um, but we also have faculty educational workshops tomorrow and Wednesday at 12 p.m. in room 216 of the library. Um, we're going to go into like more detail about OER, what it is, how to make it, and your resources on campus. So if you're interested in that, um, let me know. If you can't attend these sessions, but you're still interested in um, applying for the grant, feel free to email me or Melody, and we can give you some, you know, the slides and let you know about the details. Um, but coming is always ideal if you can. And then lastly, on Thursday, we are going to have a panel of past winners of OER grants. Um, to talk about what they did, how it went, um, spoiler, it went great for most people <laughs> um, with some issues, but not many. You can also, of course, look on here and say why OER. We have some stats about why it's important. We also have this great video that we love to show of students talking about, UNCG students talking about the cost of textbooks and how um, restrictive it is for them as students at UNCG. We also have um, other grants in North Carolina, if for some reason you can't get into this one, um, but uh, definitely let me know uh, and I can, we can talk about that as well. So that's the OER mini grants. So if you are interested in learning more about OER at UNCG, we have this OER research guide that links you out to repositories, but also again, more videos about what it is, how to use it. Um, so we have a tab for OER for educators. 
where this is great for instructors to think about using OER, giving you advocacy tools to think about OER. We also have a tab on OER for learners, which is for students thinking about OER. And then we also have a tab for OER searching, where we link you out to the major OER repositories where you can start looking for materials for your own course. Um, again, remember that OER materials are redactable and reusable. So even if you don't love the stuff that you find, or you don't find something really about your subject, talk to your librarian and we could maybe help you make one um, to put back in there. We also have OER by subject. So depending on what your topic is, like if you're from library and information science, we have links to repositories as well as things we have found that help you with OER stuff about your subject. And lastly, we have a link to a Creative Commons guide. Um, Creative Commons licenses are a lot of times how you make something open, right? How you let people know how um, reusable your stuff is, um, right? How open you wanna make it. So here's about it. Here's about the different licenses. Here's how to make it. Um, choose your own license, as well as search for CC license material on different things. Um, remember, the last thing too I'll leave you with is that every subject has a librarian. Uh, if you're staff, uh, you also have now a student success librarian within Melody to talk to you about it in terms of advising or anything like that. Um, but you have a lot of different resources through UNCG libraries to learn more about OER as well as open pedagogy. So here's the link to this guide. We're right at 26 minutes for a 30 minute webinar. I know I talk kind of fast, but we had a lot to cover. But do y'all have any questions, comments? Want me to show any of the tools today that we went over today? So the link to that document does have um, links out to all of these tools if you're interested in exploring them. Um, so if you wanted to go download the Hypothesis Chrome extension and play around with it, you could from this link, as well as um, links out to what an edit-a-thon is, how to run an edit-a-thon. Um, a lot of these open tools provide you with a lot of resources to help you if you're interested in crafting assignments. Um, you also, of course, all have great ITCs or instructional technology consultants um, that can help you as well in terms of creating these online objects or crafting assignments that do um, that are open pedagogy. Great. So people are saying thank you. We're right at the 30 minute mark. Um, definitely feel free to apply for a mini grant or let anyone know who you might be interested in applying for a mini grant. If you feel like you can't hit any of those deadlines or come to the events, let me or Melody know and um, we will uh, figure out a solution. But there's my email address. Here's Melody's email address. Great. Thank you all so much. You will receive a recording of this. It will be closed captioned within YouTube within a couple months and um, Again, let me know if y'all have any questions about open pedagogy or OER, UNCG, and uh, remember that the library is here to help. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks everyone.